Yes, uh, the difficulty of <coughs> doing this at a conference is um, that you don't know what's going to come before. Uh, and uh, uh, one sits through um, the first few sessions and um, gradually crossing things off the list of what one was going to say because uh, somebody's already said them. Um, mm -hmm. but, but also, uh, it does give me an opportunity to sort of sharpen up uh, what I'm going to do in terms of um, what I think you might actually um, want to know. And, and I'm just getting a sense at the moment that actually what you'd quite like to know from, from me representing uh, UBA is... Um, is uh, what, uh, how, how it's been for me, if you like, um, and what data we've got. Um, so what I kind of find quite helpful to do initially is um, for you to just have a, a couple of minutes to think about um, what, what data you'd like me to talk about, um, and then um, I will try and my best to answer your questions. So, um, so if you could just think about that for a moment, and um, will I introduce myself properly? Uh, that would be really helpful. If you can, if you can just sort of jot down some ideas. Like, have you got any data on this, or have you got any data on that? And and if I have it, I say, and uh, mm -hmm. I, I might have it. So uh, I should introduce myself properly. I'm Helena Gillespie. I'm the MOOC project lead for uh, for UEA. Um, I'm also Associate Dean for Learning, Teaching and Quality in the Faculty of Social Sciences and I, I'm a lecturer in education specialising in learning technology. And actually, um, the thing that qualifies me to be the big project lead is kind of those other two hats. Because I specialise in, in learning technology, in teaching <coughs> about learning technology, but I also have a, uh, an organisational managerial role within the university. And it was the fact that I wore all those two hats um, that meant uh, the Pro Vice Chancellor came and knocked on my door just before I was off on my Christmas holidays last year and said, Ah, just the woman, I've got a job for you. Um, and, um, and after I sort of picked myself up off the floor um, in surprise that we were going to do something quite so incredibly uh, cutting edge. Um, one of, the, one of the things that I said was, yes, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to find out as much as I can. And when people say, okay, what's UEA's motivation? Okay, um, uh, yeah, we think this might be good marketing. Uh, we think this is uh, good forward planning. It could be interesting for us educationally, but we are in this to find out as much as we can. Um, and uh, for me, that's kind of the major motivation. Uh, and so you've, you've had a couple of minutes now. I, I just wondered if um, anybody would now like to um, tell me if there's uh, anything that they would like to, any questions they would like me to try to answer with the data that I have in my head and some of the data that I've, I've brought with me. Is anything specific that people would like me to, to concentrate on? Um, have you converted any <laughs> okay, um, so you, want, you, you really want to know about what we're marketing. Okay, I think I can probably answer that to some extent. Okay, so you want some data about that sort of, yeah, okay, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, any, any, anything else? What were the motivations of the people who signed up for your MOOCs? Okay, you want me to get inside the Vice Chancellor's head? Okay. <laughs> No, 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 the people, no, 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 the, the, the participants. Oh, I can definitely what were the students, the, the learners? Uh, okay. I know we're supposed to call them participants, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's that, yeah, no, no, no motivation, okay? I've got quite a bit to say about that because I'm really interested in it. What the impact of doing the course of the learners? Okay, so what are they getting out of it? Okay. So motivation and the learner outcomes. Okay. Interested in the experience of the educators that went before design, development, and delivery. What challenges did they have to do? I can sort of talk anecdotally about that. I don't have survey data about that, but I can talk anecdotally about that. Are there hot spots in learner activity? So I mean, yeah. There's a whole landscape of the things that have made up the book. Where are the hot spots? Yeah, like the hot spots. Uh, okay. From a project management perspective, what's the ideal MOOC team? 
<laughs> and so then how does that translate into some co for costs? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to talk about costs actually. Um, so I have this image of you, you know, with the cave leading the MOOC team and who are your super humans beside you. Yeah, and do you know what? I was just to say something about that. The only thing that has made it happen is the willingness of everybody in this team, including very significantly people at FutureLearn, to behave like sensible, rational, reasonable human beings under the most enormous pressure. And, and I should say that while you're, while you're in the room, really, because who I'm talking about, I'm talking about Matthew and Matt in particular, but also Darmesh and Rowley and the other people who have, you know, but the MOOC team is really important. So I will talk about um, the, the MOOC team and, and, and talk a little bit about the costs and about some fluff around that as well. I've filled my page up, so I better start talking and answering questions. And then if, you, if I run out of time, then you can button hold me later and I'm happy to, to, to share the things that I've got. So, um, so I, I started off by um, planning this talk around some questions, okay? Um, so uh, let's address the first question with maybe um, what we know about MOOC learners. And we might wrap up some of that. So, um, so you know, your question was, are we, are we converting this to sign-ups? My answer is, it's too soon to say. We're in week four. Uh, we're, we're running a 10-week MOOC. Um, and in any case, I don't think that's what we were trying to do with the secret power of brands. What we were trying to do with the secret power of brands was to see how global we could make this. Now, the great thing about the secret power of brands was that the, the kind of the medium is the message for the secret power of brands, in that, that brands are a global phenomenon, and actually the richness of what's happened on the MOOC has been supported by the global nature of the learners. And um, I was actually really very excited on at 5.30 on the morning of the 14th of October when I woke up. I actually woke up, and this is, this is one of those kind of moments, it, it went live at, at one in the morning on the 14th, and I actually woke up at that moment. I thought, I'm not going to look. I can't look. Otherwise, you know, it's a, a, this, you know, divorce pending. Um, uh, and uh, so, so, but I woke up and I looked, and it was just like a magic moment because there were people already on there, real live students on there from all over the world, in, you know, in time zones kind of ahead of us, and so on. Um, and so what we were trying to do with brands was to see how global we could make this. Well, here's your answer. So all the bits coloured in blue have people have, 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 have people registered on the secret power of brands. Uh, looks like we're not touching Greenland at the moment. <laughs> and our African reach is restricted. Um, uh, but pretty much everywhere else is coloured in. Um, I'll be able to answer your question better once we finish with our next move, which is preparing for uni. Um, and um, apart from thinking that uh, preparing students for university is very important, and our, our vice chancellor was uh, recently saying quite a bit about that in the Times Higher, now we should get better at it. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do with preparing for uni is to use it as a marketing tool. And so I think probably in six months' time, I will be able to tell you whether we think that preparing for uni has actually impacted on undergraduate uh, bums on seats. Um, so it, it's, it's sort of different kind of courses for courses. Um, I'm, I'm going to go on and actually answer the next question as well with the same slide, because I've got another diagram here, and I'm not sure that you can read this as clearly as, as I'd hope you would. So um, forgive me if I just read this to you, and you, you, can, you can have this. Obviously, we'll publish these slides. So. So this data comes from the pre-course survey. Um, I've got more data than I've got, got more data than I have time to deal with at the moment. So what is the major motivation for what the people, what our learners thought they wanted to get out of the course? And the first thing is that they wanted to learn new things, and, which I guess you can take as a kind of given. And that's kind of almost 100% of them said they wanted to learn new things. So that's good. Um, uh, and, and, then, and then we've got a kind of group of things which come in sort of around the 
percent mark. So about half of the people who responded to the, the pre-course survey, um, about half of those uh, said that these were significant factors. So, um, so they wanted to try out future learn or MOOCs. Okay, and I don't underestimate the power of nosiness. Okay, and uh, we're hoping to draw in and make use of some of that nosiness. Um, but this, this, this comes back to my, I'm, I'm turning into a, uh, rapidly turning into an amateur uh, internet sociologist. I'm becoming very interested in the way that people behave online. And I read a really interesting article recently um, saying that basically lurking is okay. Um, but we have this kind of thing that we say, oh, moot com the completion rates, they're not so good. But actually, I said, uh, forget about it. It's, it's not face to face, that's not the point. Actually, lurking on a MOOC is a perfectly sensible and valid Absolutely. thing to do. And so if you're out there lurking on our MOOC, okay, and I will be lurking on your MOOC, mm -hmm. I may now be joining it. Um, uh, so uh, everybody in the future and community, I am convinced, is lurking on everybody else's MOOC. Yep. Um, but so, so I'm validating that point. So that's okay. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, um, quite, I mean, we're getting high levels of learner engagement, uh, but I'm saying lurking's okay. Um, so, uh, so, but this was an interesting one. This is where it got interesting for me. That's the next one. So, uh, people who wanted to add a fresh perspective to their current work. Now, that is really interesting for me. So, half the people are coming along, bringing something they know about this topic already, and wanting to kind of augment it using using our MOOC. So um, for me, that's that's really important. And then we've also got things like uh, learning online, improve career prospects, learn flexibly, supplement existing studies interaction, um, and find out more about university. Actually, comes in very good. Less than 10% of our people who responded to this, and there were thousands who responded to this, um, to the wanted to find out more about university. I, I'm hoping that um, when we come to do preparing for uni, and we have the same stats for preparing for uni, we will have different responses. And, and that's where things start to get interesting, because that's when we can start to take this kind of thing, this holistic thing we're kind of calling moves at the moment, and sort of channel it down the channels so that we, we want it to, to channel down. OK. Um, so what's the educator experience? Um, I don't know if I've got any data on that. Let me go back to my first slide and see, and see uh, if there's a question that kind of matches that. Um, and let's, I'll tell you what I'll do. Oh, next slide. I'm going to roll that up with uh, answering the next question. Um, with a question at the bottom, which is sort of relating to costs. Um, so uh, we're in. We've just entered what I'm calling at UEA MOOC Phase Two. Okay, MOOC Phase One was actually just getting to the point where we launched a course. Okay, and the qualification for joining in with MOOC Phase One was no closed doors. Okay, so I didn't. We didn't try at any point during the first phase to deal with anybody who wasn't completely bought in and enthusiastic about it. Because frankly, it was hard enough work as it was, just trying to understand everything and do everything and make, it, make the whole project work um, without having to deal with people's resistance. That's not that I want to uh, exclude academic colleagues. I just, I, we can't deal with them, we couldn't deal with them in that first phase. It, uh, phase two at the moment is the um, do it and find out as much as you can about why it might be useful phase. And then when we get to phase three, which is begin to target what we do more closely, then I might get to the point where I have to knock on some of those doors that maybe uh, are not so subscribed to us. Um, and, and you talked about, we talked already about you know where areas in which uh, universities are world class, are we going to move in those areas? So. For UEA, that would be creative writing, American studies, environmental, and so on. And we're not thinking in those areas at the moment. Okay, but I may need to go and knock on some of those doors. And I don't know whether they're going to be open or closed. But that's really when I'm, I'm going to have to do when I'm going to have to do that. 
Um, but the, the, I guess the thing with the educator experience is that it has been a significant learning curve. Because you sort of have to forget almost everything that you know about how you teach and start from basics. And because you're dealing not just with a different medium, but a different sort of learner, uh, and different sorts of learning resources, and different tools, and so on. Um, and so you, people have to be kind of comfortable with that. And they also have to be comfortable um, with uh, not knowing, and being a bit unsure, and it feeling a bit dangerous. And it did feel, it did, in early October, it felt really dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, but it's okay now, because uh, it's running, and it's fine, and you're getting great, great piece of feedback, um, and so that's okay. Uh, but I did feel like I took a risk at the time. I'm going to jump now down to um, the ideal MOOC team. Okay, so uh, our MOOC team goes um, me and Simon Lancaster, who's a national teacher, so uh, very tech savvy, some of you might really know Simon. Um, and um, he describes himself as my right hand man, and I think it's more, uh, more of a kind of partnership. Um, and uh, so, that, so we're sort of leading the project. We report directly to the Pro Vice Chancellor. And uh, within our team, we have, I guess we have a group of about eight academics who are mooking or preparing to mook. Oh, yes, it is a verb. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've definitely verbed that one. Uh, so we've got our group. And then uh, also in that team, we have a learning technologist. Uh, and we also have somebody from the library. Because uh, I don't know whether you know, but Future Learn have a group of Future Learn librarians have set themselves up as a little group. Yeah. And they're talking about the implications of this for learning resources, which is really interesting. Um, and so that's our group. And um, and then also we have um, the person I described as UBA's man who can, which is our we call him our course content creator. Okay, uh, and he's the person who does the day-to-day -day stuff. Um, and he's he's called Ross, and he's he's marvellous for, for for many reasons, but mostly because he's really low maintenance. You say, Ross, can you just go and do something? He just goes and does it. And for that reason, and we respect him and we, we love him. So, so you need, we kind of, we have the kind of management and then we have the academics and then I guess we have some administrative people as well. But what we do is we, we sit around the table once a month. And I think the sitting around the table once a month is actually very important. <coughs> we have an online area where we share things and all of that kind of stuff as well. But actually we sit around the table once a month and we just say, how is it going for you? And that's how we manage to stay safe. Because uh, it did, you know, it did. It is a very, very steep learning curve. Um, I'm going to move on to um, costs now, and I've deliberately got this picture here because this is not a this is not a snip from our website. This is a snip from the web website of Wolf Olins, who are a large brand management company. Okay, um, they they done you know they done some big stuff. They 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 did with Macmillan. They did with the Olympics. Um, they, they, they've got a really big reputation. And this is uh, Professor Robert Jones, he's our lead educator. And, and the great thing about Robert Jones is he works for Wolf Ollins and he works for UEA. Um, and what that enabled us to do was to put those two things together, to harness the power and the resource of Wolf Ollins and what we can do at UEA in terms of education and bring those two things together. And there is no conflict of interest there. There is power in higher education in making these collaborations. MOOCs give us the power to do that collaboration. I'm not really a fan of saying, oh, well, it's real world higher education, because uh, I don't like the idea that, uh, that universities are not the real world. I'm, I'm very kind of allergic to that idea. Um, but what it does do is it gives us that opportunity to really kind of um, link up in very demonstrable ways with um, other places. The other, other plans we've got, uh, we're linking up with other companies, we're linking up with subject associations, we had to There's people knocking on the door saying, oh, I can't believe we've done it. 
done this? And then everybody starts crying, everybody starts congratulating one another. So everything, but it was, and it, you know, it was kind of a bit cathartic. Anyway, we all got very excited about that point, okay? And then understandably, with moves, it, you know, the, it, you know, the amount of traffic has kind of leveled out, okay? Um, but what we do see here is a, is a spike, okay? And that's where Robert sent his first email. Okay, so we do know, so you can take this, we do know that emails generate traffic to the site. Mm. Uh, so we've started doing two. The other thing Robert's doing is he's doing little video messages. That doesn't mean everybody has to do that. Um, but because Robert spends his life going interesting places, uh, so he's done one for me now. Here I am in New York, how I'm in Copenhagen. It's just quite interesting for him to do that. Actually, you do find the video messages are really good at creating educated presence where uh, educated presence uh, doesn't really exist. Um, but what we do know is that, you know, um, we have this kind of pattern which is um, quite a lot of engagement um, going on in terms of uh, uh, learners and then it drops off a bit in the night uh, because uh, we don't have so many people from those time zones. Okay, and then it picks up and picks up and if we send an email we get a spike. Okay. Going forward with this data, we are still maintaining it into week four, okay? So we're not seeing, although we've seen significant drop off from day one, as you would expect, we're not seeing significant drop off going forward, okay? And we've changed pace on the MOOC now, and they're doing it, they've got that thing they're doing, they're doing it this week, they've got to do something creative, they've got to, they've got to make something, okay? And so um, that's quite, that's kind of quite interesting. And the last thing I just want to uh, I just want to add in because it's something that I'm interested in about the learners. Um, I don't know how many of you know um, Clay Shirky's book, uh, Cognitive Surplus. I think it's I love it. I just love it. I, it's one of those things. I just sit there and I go, yes, of course you write. Of course you write about this. So, so I just want to, as a sort of finishing, just sort of share a little bit of Clay Shirky's ideas. In, uh, and this is really in terms of learner motivations and, and why MOOCs are great. So he's got this idea that there is a spectrum of collaboration. So for those of you who don't know, cognitive surplus is, is the word that Clay Shirky applies to. The one trillion hours per year he estimates that um, the, the global internet connected population have at their disposal. Their, their disposal. So it's not, not time that they're working or whatever. So there are only one trillion hours a year that are out there for us to do something with. And he's terribly keen that we should do something collaborative and positive with those. And he thinks that there are basically um, four points on the, on the sharing um, spectrum. Okay, now the first thing, the first aspect of it is personal sharing. Okay? And this is sharing that doesn't really matter whether it has an audience. It's just something that I've done. And his favorite example of that is the Can I Has a Cheeseburger website. Uh, uh, lol, if you're familiar with lol cats, okay? Uh, so cute pictures of cats with badly spelled captions. Okay, people post them and they, then they get onto Facebook. Okay, and some people love them and some people hate them. And it doesn't really matter if anybody else doesn't, doesn't see your lol cat. Okay, it just, uh, you just kind of feel satisfied in doing it yourself. And there's no necessary intrinsic value in, in that, but, but that's the sort of personal sharing, okay? And then there's what he calls communal sharing, okay? And, um, and he, he, he describes that as, as a sharing to, to meet the needs of the people in the group. So, so for websites like meetup.com, where the benefit is, for, is definitely for the group, but it's only for the people in the group. Okay, um, the third sort, sort is public sharing, um, which is um, where things are created by, the, by a group, but they have benefits to lots of people. And this example of that is the people who created the programming language Apache. Um, so um, so the, the group do it, but it has wider public benefit. Whereas for here, the benefit is just in the group, and here, the, the benefit. And then the, the kind of, um, the most, the most valuable sort of sharing, as far as he's concerned, is civic sharing. And that sort of brings together all of these things. And that's where a group of people do something 
which then has wider benefit for everybody. So a really good example of that is Yushihibi, which is um, the website that was created by people uh, trying to uh, globally, uh, geographically map um, events. It, it started off in, in disputed elections in Kenya, but it's used for all sorts of things now. And that's where the benefit of something that a group of people have done that's internet enabled actually benefits everybody. Um, and my, my question to you, just as I finish really, is, is where do we put MOOC participants on this scale? Uh, you know, is this just something that people are doing for themselves or for the group? Is there a wider benefit? I would really like to think that actually, but if we get really, really good at this, what we can do is we can actually mean, we can actually move and become a form of civic sharing where, um, where actually what happens on MOOCs is that, the, you know, the global understanding and knowledge and interest and engagement is actually fostered through this kind of, through this kind of medium. Um, and then I think maybe in terms of my own perspective, um, we will have achieved our own